my name is TJ Ligori. I am an applications engineer and product manager of the image analysis team here at Invicro. And I would like to start off by welcoming everyone to the VivaQuant 2.0 release webinar. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, information to cover today, uh, starting you know, just with a quick introduction to Invicro for those of you who don't know or who you know, may be interacting with one of our groups, but you know, we'll just quickly go through the different things that Invicro is uh, interested in doing right now. And then, of course, we'll you know, do an overview of VivaQuant 2.0 as well as VivaQuant as a whole. Uh, and then we'll you know, go into the software. We'll give a, a demo for viewing, pre-processing, analyzing data, and you know, of course, pointing out new VivaQuant 2.0 features along the way. And at the end of the day, I'll, I'll leave about 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Also, you know, if there is a question that, that comes up along the way, feel free to, to shout it out. But as I said, I will also leave time at the end. So in Vicro, we're an imaging solutions provider. We're located in Boston, Massachusetts, where we were founded in 2008. Uh, however, like many of you on the call uh, and many of our customers who might be listening to the recording later on, uh, you know, we are essentially a global company. We have locations in London, England, as well as people stationed in Germany, and a Cyclotron facility in, in Michigan uh, through our, trans our partnership at the Translational Imaging Center. We have a team comprised of over 50 research scientists with a broad array of backgrounds uh, from you know, biology, physics, software engineering, electrical engineering, optics, all of these things. And really what that does is it allows us as a team to both talk the talk and, like we like, like to say, walk the walk. Uh, you know, we're, we are also imaging scientists, just like many of the people who are using our software on a daily basis. And in fact, internally speaking, we do consider ourselves to be the biggest users of our own software. Overall, we do have a broad experience of applications. Uh, because of how we sit, where you know we're constantly interacting with a variety of different uh, you know academic groups and uh, pharmaceutical companies, we do get a lot of influence from a lot of different places, and it really allows us to sort of uh, you know have our hands in a lot of different fields, all within the the imaging space. Whether we're looking at neurology, oncology, cardiology, etc., we really try to expand our horizons in all of these areas at the same time. And we do that in all of our departments, whether it's the software department, the contract research department, or the image analysis department. Now, many of you on the call may be working with one, two, maybe even all three of these departments, but I just want to quickly go through kind of what each of us are doing. So in terms of the software team, you know, as you all know, we do generate two software platforms. The VivoQuant, which is our viewing and analysis platform that we'll be reviewing today, and also the IPAX, which is our data management and storage component, which is our web-based platform. Together, they're used in over 150 imaging centers worldwide, as well as 70% of the top pharmaceutical companies. And with these two software platforms, it really allows us to drive our two main uh, services, which is the contract research division, which truly works with pharmaceutical companies and academic groups to take imaging studies from A to Z, from conception through imaging analysis and reporting uh, for anything from preclinical, you know, where we're talking mice, rats, uh, all the way up through, you know, first in human studies. And our image analysis services, which play into that as well, <clears throat> uh, you know, which is a department really built on efficiency and novel image analysis techniques, uh, where again, working with customers to develop techniques to really improve their image analysis routines and also uh, their end results. Ultimately, at Invicro, we try to be a company that can take any of your imaging problems A to Z. All of this kind of feeds into the notion of using the software as well as any of the services to the best of their ability. Overall, Invicro has supported over 600 imaging study efforts and 
real-time data analysis in collaboration with over 100 sponsors. But that's enough about Invicro. As a whole, let's uh, focus on VivaQuant. That is why everyone's here today. So quickly to go over what's new in VivaQuant 2.0, <clears throat> we have a redesigned interface with, when you open it, you'll see all the buttons have changed. It's much more sleek, stylish, you know, kind of a new look. We have a brand new license management system. Many of you have already been introduced to it, and I will speak to it a little bit more as we go through the, the demo. We've improved our auto radiography uh, applications with a brand new module, as well as improved viewing for large 2D data. Also improved our ability to handle clinical data uh, using both radiological or neurological views and the ability to switch back and forth between these in real time. We've improved our rendering performance for single and multi-channel image data. We've extended also our 3D volume rendering tools with a brand new histogram-based opacity mapper. Uh, and also we've improved our MR tools. We've expanded our data format support, added some workflow assistance, redesigned the help guide, expanded VivoQuant func VivoScript functions, excuse me, and improved the integration with the Vicro IPAX platform. As you can see, this is a very long list. I'll try to hit all these things throughout the call. If I do miss something that you really want us to go back and review, or if you have additional questions after the call, as always, feel free to reach out to your Invigro account manager or support at invigro.com. So here we have it, the new VivoQuant 2.0. The first thing you'll notice right off the bat, as I mentioned, the buttons have all changed colors. We've really tried to streamline a lot of the UI design of the software to make it more efficient, easier to use, and easier for you to go from point A to point B with your data. This includes the new license manager that I spoke of before. And as many of you will have known through your experiences already, and if not, I really encourage you to upgrade to 2.0 and get, uh, get your licenses upgraded accordingly, is that now uh, VivaQuant licenses no longer need to be emailed to you by our internal license management team. Rather, we've kind of put the keys in the hands of the customer to be able to distribute their licenses throughout their groups accordingly. This includes two new methods of license management. One is very similar to the old method where a user will register right in the software and a license, manage, a license account manager will be notified and have the ability to approve it. In the past, this has been an in vitro representative. Moving forward, this can be someone within your own group. Really and ideally, this should just speed up the process and give you quicker and easier access to your license and therefore to the software so that you can get going with your analysis. We've also added a batch registration tool. This allows you to import multiple users at a single time so that you don't have to be dealing with hardware keys and individual emails. And many of you may have already done this to access your accounts. The license account manager can just provide a list to the software on the website where they tell you where they just import the email address and name of the end user, and a license gets automatically emailed to them, uh, including instructions for how to register that license to their computer. Finally, the third thing that we've added that really will help in license management is, you know, in the past, a lot of asked about, you know, switching licenses from one computer to the other. We have now improved how we can do that using this return license button in the registration window on a registered computer. By clicking the return license button, you are removing the license from your computer and returning it to the pool of licenses available for your site. Basically, this just means that if you'd like to move a license from one location to the other, you don't have to wait for Invicro to approve it. You just return that license to the pool, and then your license account manager can release that license to a new computer. 
Here I'm obviously going to say no, I do not want to return my license right now. That would make for a very short demo. So once you're registered and your license has been installed, now you're ready to use the software. As I said, the buttons are all new and different, but a lot of it has really stayed the same in terms of functionality. One thing I will point out in the hint, <clears throat> we have a brand new hint. And if you're not familiar with the hints, I definitely recommend you check them out. And in here we have just a quick dialogue that shows where the old buttons were located in the tools menu and where they're located now in the new VivoQuant 2.0 layout. You like to think that the new layout is more intuitive and more workflow based so that you can more quickly customize your data. So as I said, we've trimmed down the tools menu to really just be the main tools that you need to use on your day-to-day -day basis, whether that's pre-processing data, resampling data, editing your DICOM headers, making images and movies. Really the main focus of the software. Then we also have added our advanced modules tool. This drop-down includes your plug-in modules, your advanced spec and CT analysis tools. Sort of the things that you may not need to use on a day-to-day -day basis, but are still very, very useful within the software. <clears throat> As I said with VivoQuant 2.0, we've also added new and improved data loading and data, data handling tools. With that, we've added support for additional uh, file types, including Paravision 6, Trifoil data, Gamma Medica PET data, Medizo Dynamic MR data, auto radiography from the Bass and Phillips scanners, RGB data, and much more. And for those who don't know, for loading your local data or DICOM data located on a PAC server, it's very, very easy. You can access that data simply by going to File, Open Data, Open Local Data for data stored on your own computer. If you are using an IPAX or another server, you can just go to the data browser. So let's start by opening some local DICOM data. Here it brings me to a local DICOM folder. You'll see the same folder contains all of my .dcm files, but these are really just a pain in the butt to work with. Everyone knows nobody wants to try to figure out what data they're looking at by the UID. We've handled that for you. By selecting this folder and refreshing, you see here are those data sets that we were just looking at, now organized based on the DICOM standard using the patient name, study date, study description, and patient ID and organized based on the study instance and series instance UID. So here, let's open this spec CT example. This is a dynamic spec CT brain scan. So you'll see here we have the data loaded, the views haven't changed, still be able to access the data very similarly to how we have in the past. Right off the bat, however, one thing that we have changed is in our time series and in our time series tool in the past, you may remember, it was very difficult to view a time series if the scale of the data were different from frame to frame. We've now taken care of that with our global option. So we can now set a global min max and it will maintain that global min max throughout the data. So every frame is scaled the same way. You don't have to worry if you're visualizing something incorrectly. We've also added improved viewing in the 3D space. So if we open our maximum intensity projection and initialize, you'll see here while we still have maintained our classic MIP view, like so, and I'll turn off the extra green. We've also improved our VTK viewer.
So now, in the past, you haven't had access to this opacity gradient. Uh, basically, what we've done is we've removed the uh, external MIP viewer that we had previously and incorporated the opacity ramp into directly into VivoQuant. And what this does is it allows you to use the VTK viewer so you can still zoom out, zoom in, move the data around as you would like, which you can't do in the traditional MIP viewer, but you can also adjust the, these opacities. And the best way to understand this is to just think of your histogram along this x-axis here and then you're just setting which values you wish to show or hide. So I can hide the brightest values if I want and look at this strange image here. Or I can show just the bright images, the bright values, doing something like this. And I can do that for any of the inputs, whether that's the reference, so if I brighten the reference up, input one or input two. And then again, we still have the ability to make a movie of this data just by clicking the same Save Movie button that you've always been clicking. And of course, you can also still play your rotating Mint movie, which everyone has come to, to know and love. Also, uh, in terms of viewing functionality, we've improved the viewing for data with high in-plane resolution, whether this is 2D autoradiography data or even just MR data with very high resolution in-plane and the large slice thickness. We've improved our speed of rendering if you're trying to zoom in or zoom out of that data, trying to just, you know, again, improve your workflows and make your lives simpler. Many of the other tools in DuQuant haven't really changed. For instance, our reorientation tool and other pre-processing tools have largely stayed the same. So, for instance, we can still run the same uh, automated reorientation op operators, whether that's, you know, just doing a quick registration like this and applying that to all of the data. Things like this have not have not changed. One thing in terms of pre-processing that we have updated uh, is in the cropping tool. As a result of the improvements we've made in the autoradiography space, one thing that we've added is the ability to have a rectangular transverse view. So for many of you, you'll remember in the past, the transverse view was required to be square or the same in both the X and Y dimensions. This is no longer the case we can now support a rectangular view, so I can crop, for instance, rectangularly, and VivoQuant won't automatically make that square. It will maintain that rectangular nature. What this means for your workflows moving forward is just that you need to be uh, more aware of where you're cropping your data, uh, particularly, if you're, particularly if you're trying to be consistent across data sets. We no longer will enforce that to be square, so it's important just to be careful as you go. The last thing that we've added in terms of uh, your pre-processing is just the ability to save data. As much as we always have been able to, we've just added some additional formats to the ITK saver, particularly the ability to save in nifty. <laughs> Also, I'll show it here, uh, not particularly interesting for the preclinical space, but for anyone doing any clinical work, uh, one other tool that we have added is the ability to switch back and forth between what we call the neurologist view and the radiologist view. Uh, so as many of you may know, a radiologist traditionally will look at data such as you would face a patient. So if you see the image here, it appears as though the, the heart is on the your right as opposed to our traditional way of viewing data, which is the neurologist view, which is that you're looking more at data in a mirror or from behind a patient, for instance. So that's just how you can quickly switch back and forth between those two views. 
Uh, this was particularly of interest to our, uh, our clinical partners who would like to analyze the data in VivoQuant but also be able to view it simultaneously in an external DICOM viewer. Sort of just also looking at some additional tools that we've uh, just moved just to bring them to your attention. Uh, the workflow assistant pre-processing tool and resampling data are now directly under the tools menu. For anyone not familiar with the workflow assistant, this is a very nice tool that allows users to write their own workflows. So you can write step-by-step -step instructions for your colleagues to always follow the same procedure, whether they're pre-processing data, making QC images, whatever the case may be. And these are just simple XML files. And this is an old tool, but it's important to know that it is still active. We've also added some additional new functionality or uh, new workflows into the uh, default tools here. Uh, we've edited the existing ones to update along with uh, you know new tool locations within the software. We've also added the auto radiography analysis workflow, which I'll go through live uh, later on. The resampling hasn't changed. We still simply select tools, resample data, and can change. So, for instance, we want to re upsample this to 0.3 millimeter voxels. We can do that very simply. One tool that we have uh, done some work on is our DICOM anonymization tools. Uh, so here under tools, DICOM, you'll see we can still anonymize DICOM data just as we always have. One thing that we have uh, updated is the workflow. So for data that's already been loaded, here I'll say no, I want to edit all the loaded data. So again, this will look very much the same as it always has. What we have changed is that for data that's already loaded, we no longer support uh, automatic storage to the IPACs for already loaded data or locally held data. So we would just need to say OK to the anonymization. And then we can just right click and save the data as DICOM or use the pre-processing tool to save it to the IPACs. We do, however, still support, so if we unload this data, we do still support selecting the DICOM anonymizer and then loading data from an existing repository into the anonymizer, like this. And then you can store it to an existing iPatch repository. As I've said, we've also added some additional uh, MRI processing tools. So here I'll just open up some MR data. So here you see we have just a single uh, MR of a brain, but you know there's, there are some issues with it. Uh, primarily, we pull down this color bar here, and as we always have, you'll see there's quite a bias in the image. So one thing that we've added uh, through a collaboration with one of our sponsors is a non-uniformity or bias field correction that's now located in the filtering tool under bias field correction. And what we're doing here is we're just using the N3 algorithm to uh, basically normalize the brightness of the image that occurs as a result of the acquisition. So here, what we can do is we have just a few options. Uh, if there are requests for additional settings to be made available, uh, this is something that we may be able to do. Uh, just please bring it up with your VivaQuant account manager. So a down sample factor, this is simply just related to the speed of being able to perform the, the correction. Uh, you know, if it's a very high down sample, it will be very quick, but it might not be quite as good. I find that a, the, a down sample factor of two works perfectly well. In terms of the mask, so right now the options are iterative, otsu, and background. You can include a mask of 
any region of interest drawn in the 3D ROI tool. So for instance, if we drew a region of just the brain, we could use that and only per calculate our bias field within that region. The iterative ATSU uses a foreground from background separation technique repeated multiple times in iteration to determine on its own where the bright values are within the image and correct for them that way. We can also append the resulting data. If we don't select this, then the loaded data will simply be edited. And we can apply the bias field if we're interested in seeing what correction has been applied. So here you can see loaded right now, we have the original data, the bias field, and then here's our new data set. I'll switch it to gray. And now if I pull this down, so that's the same or similar color palette as the original. I switch back and forth and you can see that we need to go a little bit brighter. But much of this bias has been corrected and it's a more smooth transition of brightness throughout the image now. Now this image wasn't terribly bad to begin with, however, the tool does also, you know, can also correct for much more uh, elaborate biases or, uh, you know, a, a much larger difference than we have in this particular image. The other tool we've added on a similar note and also for kind of the same project is in our arithmetic tool. We've added a scalar exponentiation. So you can scalar multiply each voxel within an image by a given value, uh, or exponentiate, excuse me, by a given, uh, by a given value. Uh, and this is really helpful, particularly in, in MR, if you're trying to do any sort of normalization or, you know, uh, redistribution of values to a given min and max, you might need to exponentiate. Uh, if you want to correct for a, a certain curve or something along those lines. And then this works very similarly to any of our other uh, arithmetic tools. You simply tell it what input you'd like to use and what you'd like that uh, exponentiation value to be. So say we want to square every value within the image, we say OK. <coughs> for here we're just looking at input 2. Now you can see these values have all been squared. Doesn't look very different, but you know, that, that would be how you would go about performing that sort of a, of a task. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is just our handling of uh, white light or, and or autoradiography data. Uh, and this is through our brand new uh, CQUANT module, uh, which some of you may have included in your licenses. Uh, if not and you're interested, again, please contact your VivaQuant uh, account representative. So for first we'll load some uh, white light RGB data. We load this the same way that we would load any other data, just using the same uh, file loading tools. One thing to point out is that if you are loading, uh, whether it's a JPEG or PNG, you do need to change what data sets you're looking for. So for instance, I want to look for image files. And here we have our white light JPEG image. The first thing that will come up is a prompt to tell me or to ask me the voxel sizes of the image. Uh, you know, this is something that you'll have to know going in. For instance, I know that this image is 0 0.0442 millimeters. With a, it's only a single slice, so I don't care too much about the slice thickness. And here's the data. Now, one thing you'll notice is that loaded much quicker than any 2D data has loaded in the past. And we can also 
zoom in, zoom out much more quickly and easily than we have been able to do previously. <coughs> As this is RGB data, we've also added some support for viewing the individual RGB channels. So if we turn off the show RGB option, we're now looking at just the grayscale version of the data. We can show just the red channel, the green channel, an average of the RGB channels, or you know, really anything that's dropped down. And of course, like I said, we can show the RGB. Once you have this data load, you can do any of the normal things that you can do in VivaQuant, whether that's resampling, cropping, reorientation. All of those operations are still uh, supported, as are any of our 3D ROI operations. But you know, a lot of people aren't interested in just their white light. They want to also be able to look at their AutoRAD data. So we've also added support for that. So if we append an AutoRAD image here, So again, it's going to ask me for the slice thickness. As I am only loading a single slice, this isn't of great interest to me right now. So now I have my data loaded. And if I pull down the color palette, you'll see there's some auto red data overlaid on the white light. It's not registered. I'll go through that in a minute. But the first thing that we'll want to do is perform some sort of calibration for this auto red image. So we'll quickly make the auto red data the reference. So you can see it here. And we have our auto we have our calibration standard at the bottom. So if we go into the 3D ROI tool, we've added in this operator menu an auto radiography calibration option. This tool, again, brand new. First thing it will do is ask me how many auto red or how many calibration standards I wish to use. In this case, I'll just say eight. And then it'll ask me if I also want to use a background ROI. I'll say yes. Now here we just use our pre-existing 3D ROI tools to place the regions on the standards. Say okay. And then I can just quickly go through Draw a quick background. And then each of the standards in turn. Let's zoom in a little bit. Standard one, two, three, four. Now I have all my standards. I again open the calibration window. I tell it if I want to do any weighting, what my output unit should be. So this will be, you know, what your uh, calibrating to. We tell it if there is a background. In this case, there is, and then we can read the values from the image. So now on the in this column we have the PSL per millimeter squared values or the raw values from the AutoRAD data. We then provide the real world values or the you know micro carry values for instance. And these can be copy and pasted right from an Excel sheet, like so. We can also edit these manually, so if I wanted to change this number, I could do so. Then we say run, and when we do that, it will give us a plot of our uh, curve for the calibration. If we don't like the curve or we just think we need to change the error weights, we can do that just by running it again. We can also save this plot as well as this table using these buttons. We can also reset the ROIs and start over. But if we like the, the fit curve, simply say apply. It will tell us what calibration was applied to the data. We say OK. And now if we check our min max tool, you'll see that we've now changed the values to microcurry per milligram, real world quantifiable information. But again, 
what's most important is being able to now do something with that information. So if we go back here, we flip the white light and the auto red back again. So we still have both loaded. Apply a new. So one issue now is that we're still not fully registered. But using our distance and annotation tool, uh, we have an old tool that still is very functional and will be very helpful for performing reorientation of this data. All we have to do is tell it, using the fiducials in the image, we can tell it a starting point, or I'm sorry, the end point and the starting point. And we tell it to calculate the reorientation. And now you can see with just that little bit, we've now registered the AutoRad data to the white light. We can unload our original AutoRad data and go into the 3D ROI tool. And now we can perform any of our region of interest in, uh, analysis. Whether that's you know drawing regions of a given uh, region within the white light data or using the AutoRad data to, to find a region based on the brightness, whatever is of most interest to your group can be done very quickly and easily now. So if we just get rid of all of our regions, and add one, say, to the liver, and then, you know, the, the 3DRI tool hasn't changed very much. Uh, again, like with most of you, the buttons have changed, but that's about it. And then we can quantify this information, just as we always have been able to do. So that's really it in terms of upgrades and new features within VivoQuant. As I said, the biggest thing is just being able to navigate uh, you know, more quickly, more easily. A big uh, focus this entire relief cycle has been on improving performance and you know, improving the workflows and usability of the software. And of course, also our brand new uh, 2D and uh, RGB data handling tools. Uh, other than that, you know, I leave it up to the rest of the people on the call. If anyone has any questions, please uh, now would be the time, or else, uh, you know, we can certainly follow up later on, whether that's in separate conversations or in a follow-up call. I would also point out quickly that with the new release, we have also, as always, upgraded our help guide. Still available both online and within the software. And also, I encourage everyone to check out our blog if they're interested in any additional tools or features uh, at blog.invicro.com. Uh, so with that, does anybody have any questions or anything else they would uh, like to see within the new software? OK, great. If not, um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Good luck uh, using the software moving forward. If you do have any questions that come up, Again, please feel free to reach out to us at support at invicro.com uh, or to your uh, dedicated Invicro account representative. Uh, again, you can also contact me at any time. My name is TJ Ligori, and my email is tliguori at invicro.com. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, and thank you for coming to the webinar.